wonder who's going to be more irritated by this video, elder goths or metalheads? Either way, I'm expecting to be called a poser in the comments. Good evening, my name is Dante and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, I discuss strange and obscure media. I know it has taken me forever to get around to making this video. I have been balancing work, school, and two new projects, so I appreciate those of you who have been patient with me getting back on my game. Tonight's topic is going to be a little bit different from what I would normally cover. Most of my videos so far have been about specific artists, albums, or movies. This video is going to be my personal deep dive on an entire subgenre of music. That subgenre is gothic metal. This is a niche of music that has remained a favorite of mine since I began listening to rock and metal artists. It was ultimately the stepping stone that led me into extreme metal as well as gothic rock and dark wave. Interestingly enough, gothic metal is a niche of music that is often disowned by fans of goth music as well as fans of metal. Gothic metal isn't goth. Gothic metal isn't real metal. So I am here to talk a bit about the style, the history behind it, my personal thoughts on it, and some of the artists of both past and present who have kept the sound alive. Before I get into the bulk of the video, I want to preface this by saying that much of the history I'll be discussing comes from before my time. I have no intentions of being a revisionist or objectively defining what style of music was considered what 30 years ago. Everything I'll be discussing comes from years of listening to the genre, reading and writing album reviews, spending countless hours looking up artists within the genre, and discussing it on various online forms. I also conducted a survey in which I had fans of gothic metal provide their input on the genre and will be using some of their feedback to weigh in as well. Anyway, without further ado, let's dive in. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. The real burning question that many seem to have is what is gothic metal? And this has prompted a wide range of responses over the years. To those of you who are familiar with this genre of music, comment below to tell me what band comes to your mind when you think of gothic metal. If we are to reference Wikipedia, RateYourMusic.com, and various online forms dedicated to heavy metal music, the general consensus is that gothic metal is a combination of heavy metal instrumentation with the gloomy, morose atmosphere and catchy mid-tempo rhythms of gothic rock. However, this basic description then poses the question of how do bands as different as Typo Negative, Theater of Tragedy, and Cradle of Filth then all fall under this umbrella? Well, that's what I'm here for today. In order to understand where gothic metal comes from, we're going to go all the way back to the late 1980s. At this point in time, thrash, speed, doom, and heavy metal were established genres, death metal was beginning to formulate, and black metal was in its first wave. Louder productions, chaotic riffs, heavier tones, faster drumming, and harsh sounding vocals were being pushed to the extreme as artists within the metal genre wanted to make very abrasive, diabolical music. Meanwhile, goth had become well established both as a genre of music as well as its own subculture. Gothic rock itself was rooted in a gloomy and macabre take on post-punk. The sound was primarily defined by swirling, corrosive sounding guitars soaked in chorus and flanger effects, driving bass lines, drumming that ranged anywhere from frantic hypnotic patterns to stark programmed beats and often dramatic low-range singing. With the rise of gothic rock, various subgenres and twists on the style began to emerge, such as death rock, cold wave, dark wave, ethereal wave, neoclassical dark wave, etc. While these other categories had varying connections to goth and their own unique nuances, the overall consistent factors that tie these artists together were their dark romanticism, morose yet catchy songwriting, and of course their aesthetic. In the late 80s, a thrash metal band from Switzerland known as Celtic Frost had made waves in the realm of extreme music with their releases Morbid Tales and Two Megatherion. Their 1987 album, Into the Pandemonium, saw the act experimenting a bit with their sound. While Black Sabbath, Judas Priest, and Venom were among the band's metal influences, they also had taken notable inspiration from the likes of Bauhaus, Susie and the Banshees, and Christian Death, all of which are some of the biggest names within the realm of gothic rock. This inspiration can be detected in the mix as twinkling clean guitar melodies bleed into the aggressive riffs and the vocals of frontman Tom G. Warrior take on a dramatic baritone wail, giving a clear nod to the distinctive singing style of Roz Williams from Christian Death. 
The album as a whole is very eclectic and avant-garde, though these specific facets of the sound demonstrate an early example of a metal artist incorporating influences from goth music. Over the next couple of years, a few lesser-known albums would surface as being early contenders of a similar approach. Museum Hermeticum was the first demo of an Italian band known as Monumentum, released in 1989. The musical approach of the band at the time was heavily influenced by the aforementioned Celtic Frost and Christian Death, incorporating heavy influences from Gothic rock and Death rock in its deep moaning vocal style and chorus heavy tones over doom metal riffing. Meanwhile, a Swedish band known as Stillborn released a debut entitled Necro Spirituals that same year, which combined traditional doom riffing with corrosive guitars and deep baritone singing akin to that of Andrew Eldritch from Sisters of Mercy. Stillborn's stylistic approach would foreshadow the signature sound of what we today consider to be one of the pinnacle acts of gothic metal, that band being Typo Negative. Typo Negative formed at the tail end of the 80s by vocalist bassist Peter Steele after his former band Carnivore split up. Steele came from a wide variety of influences, citing Black Sabbath, The Beatles, The Ramones, Pink Floyd, Bauhaus, Sisters of Mercy, among many, many others. While Carnivore's music took on a chaotic form of crossover and thrash metal, the works of Typo Negative primarily consisted of slow, brooding songs with gritty tones, spooky organs and synths, Peter's throaty baritone voice, and of course, their dark and gloomy aesthetic. The band would achieve major commercial success with their albums Bloody Kisses and October Rust, both of which continue to be two of the most recognized and celebrated albums within the gothic metal genre to this day. Though they would disband in 2010 due to Peter's death, they maintained this unique trademark sound consistently throughout their career and brought major inspiration to countless artists. While Typo Negative reigned here in the United States, bands in Europe began a sort of renaissance in sound throughout the early 90s. With death and black metal flourishing as established genres, more extreme metal artists began to branch out from the confines of those styles. This brings us to what we now know as the Peaceville Three, Paradise Lost, My Dying Bride, and Anathema. These were three bands from England who all signed to Peaceville Records in the early 90s and respectively played their own unique blends of doom and death metal. While they were among some of the pioneering acts of Death Doom, they also began to expand upon their sound with musical nuances outside of extreme metal. Paradise Lost's 1991 album, aptly titled Gothic, meshed ugly growls and abrasive riffing with chorus-soaked guitar tones and mid-tempo post-punk rhythms inspired by Sisters of Mercy, as well as operatic soprano singing and full orchestral sections. My Dying Bride's 1993 album, Turn Loose the Swan, saw the band combining powerful death doom riffing with clean tenor vocals as well as prominent usage of piano and violin, giving a strong nod to influences from neoclassical dark waves such as Dead Can Dance. Anathema's 1995 album, The Silent Enigma, took considerable inspiration from the aforementioned Celtic Frost, as they would also utilize weeping clean vocals alongside aggressive death doom riffing, as well as lengthy atmospheric interludes of clean guitars and keyboards. This combination of extreme metal with the brooding sounds of gothic rock and dark wave began to explode throughout Europe, with various other artists delving into similar territories. Catatonia, Tiamat, Moonspell, Cradle of Filth, Lake of Tears, Sentence are only a handful of names who would follow suit, with many of them releasing material that would demonstrate a fully fleshed out crossover between gothic rock and metal. Two albums that are especially notable for this include Draconian Times by Paradise Lost and Wild Honey by Tiamat, both of which are considered textbook examples of gothic metal. Around this time, other bands began to bring lead front women on board and focus on creating a more atmospheric, introspective approach. Norwegian act The Third and the Mortal are the first known band to take on a more ethereal sounding approach to doom metal. Their debut album, Tears Laid in Earth, combined melodic doom riffing with lush clean guitar passages and the gentle mezzo-soprano singing of Kerry Ruslaten. Dutch act The Gathering followed suit with their third album, Mandy Lion. This particular album took great inspiration from ethereal wave artists like Dead Can Dance and Cocteau Twins, 
as the hypnotic song structures, haunting keyboards, and the powerful alto singing of Annika van Heersbergen were integrated into doom metal riffing. Another Norwegian act known as Theater of Tragedy paired deep guttural vocals with the fragile soprano singing of Liv Christine over a mix of death doom riffing, goth rock inspired passages, sinister keyboard melodies, and lyrics written in Old English to create a medieval tone. The band's second album, Velvet Darkness They Fear, is highly regarded as being one of the prime examples of gothic doom metal, while their third album, Aegis, is an essential demonstration of gothic rock turned metal. Following in the path of theater of tragedy, more Norwegian acts such as Tristania, The Sins of Thy Beloved, and Trail of Tears would take on a similar musical approach. These bands would also balance out guttural vocals and soprano singing, clean guitar interludes inspired by gothic rock, as well as prominent usage of keyboards and violins over aggressive riffing. This established a particular variant of gothic metal that many would describe as beauty and the beast metal, reflecting on the vocal interplay. Dutch acts within Temptation and After Forever would also start out in this direction inspired by theater of tragedy. Their debut albums, respectively titled Enter and Prison of Desire, also featured the vocal interplay of soprano singing in deep gutturals, sinister keyboard melodies, and ominous riffing of 90s gothic doom. However, their later albums would lighten their sound significantly and place more emphasis on full orchestral and choral arrangements, ultimately ridding itself of the more macabre nature that was associated with gothic metal. This transition away from their darker roots and the more accessible musical territory is a pretty solid representation of where the lines between gothic and symphonic metal began to blur. With that, we enter the 2000s, which is when the style of gothic metal would become more heavily saturated and less definable as one specific sound. A sort of polarity began to exist within the style in which gothic metal became an umbrella term to describe two distinctly different nuances. You had more rock-driven bands inspired by Typo Negative, whose sound was primarily guitar-driven, had mid-tempo riffs, catchy songs, and clean baritone vocals. Then you had more symphonic-sounding bands inspired by Theater of Tragedy who leaned more into their heavy usage of keyboards and featured soprano singing either in a lead role or alternating with harsh vocals. With the rise of symphonic metal, bands such as Epica and Nightwish began to be lumped in with gothic metal artists, primarily for having lead front women and prominent usage of keyboards and orchestral arrangements in their music. Likewise, the genre began extending to even more commercially successful artists in alternative music, such as Hem, Evanescence, and Lacuna Coil. Whether or not you consider these artists to actually be gothic metal is up to your own interpretation, but regardless, album reviews, record labels, and fans of the artist alike considered them all to be one and the same. Meanwhile, many of the artists who pioneered the genre were gradually shifting away from the style. Anathema and The Gathering had gone into some light, moody, alternative rock. Tiamat and Paradise Lost went full-on goth. Theater of Tragedy went into electronic and industrial territory. Essentially, the concept of mixing goth with metal was no longer a novelty or some brand new thing for bands to experiment with. It was becoming a bit dried up or predictable. However, there was still a decent handful of relevant artists that continued to fan the flames. Typo Negative, Virgin Black, Moonspell, and My Dying Bride continued to maintain solid careers throughout the 2000s, with the latter two still releasing material as of 2024. Meanwhile, you also had Sirenia and Draconian rising up in the ranks to continue the Beauty and the Beast approach to gothic metal, utilizing soprano vocals, keyboards, and poetic lyrics alongside harsh vocals and aggressive riffing. In 2006, the aforementioned Celtic Frost would release their fifth and final album, Monotheist. Monotheist came full circle from the band's dabbling into goth territory on Into the Pandemonium, further expanding on the sound they established back in 1987. The album blends intensely heavy doom metal riffing with sinister deep vocals, clean guitar interludes, soprano singing, choirs, and orchestral passages. After this album, Celtic Frost would disband and Tom G. Warrior would begin a new band called Trypticon, which would follow in the same musical approach of combining gothic elements with doom and extreme metal. 
Around this time, some of the originators of Gothic metal would start to come back to their roots, such as Paradise Lost and Tiamat. Meanwhile, some newer acts were beginning to find their own unique approaches to the style. For example, Woods of Ypres were a melodic black metal band from Canada who gradually shifted into a very moody and straightforward blend of doom and gothic metal in the way of typo negative. In Solitude were a Swedish band whose third album Sister melds heavy metal with significant influences of gothic rock and post-punk in its guitar work. Another Swedish act known as Tribulation formed their roots in death metal, but with their third album Children of the Night would fully transition into a blackened take on gothic metal which they have continued to play ever since. Throughout the 2010s up to the time of this video in 2024, gothic metal has continued to remain low-key in popularity as a genre of metal. However, the albums that have come out in this era from gothic metal bands, whether old or new, have been some of the best that I've heard in the genre so far. In 2016, Swedish and Finnish act Trees of Eternity released their posthumous full-length album, Hour of the Nightingale, after the death of their singer, Elias Stanbridge. Stylistically, their sound is a melodic blend of doom and gothic metal driven by whispery lead vocals and somber guitar work. In 2019, an American act known as Idle Hands released their debut album Mana, which consisted of a catchy and energetic blend of heavy metal and gothic rock riffing. They would eventually change their name to Unto Others, which they continue to perform under to this day. In 2020, Swedish act Draconian released their seventh studio album Under a Godless Veil. The band has been one of the most consistent acts in gothic metal since the release of their debut in 2003, though this particular album has been a high point in their career thus far. On Under a Godless Veil, their blend of death doom with gothic and ethereal wave elements represent a modern take on the mid-90s era of bands such as My Dying Bride or Theater and Tragedy, retaining some of the grit of those artists though with a more icy and mysterious sounding execution. In 2022, French act Hangman's Chair released their sixth album, A Loner. This band started out in more of a stoner metal approach, though gradually became more somber and melodic over the course of their discography. This particular album is a straightforward blend of doom metal and gothic rock in the way of Paradise Lost and Typo Negative, led by the charismatic singing of frontman Cedric Tofuti. These are only a few of the gothic metal albums that have grabbed my attention over the past 10 years, among plenty of others. I feel the artists who are coming out of the woodwork are successfully carrying the torch of the sound that was established in the 90s, while still finding their own unique twist to keep it sounding fresh. I'm looking forward to what comes next within the genre and what newer artists will bring to the table. So now that we've broken down the history of some notable artists and albums within the genre, that brings us back to the original question. What is gothic metal? What defines it as a genre? Here's my take on it. Gothic metal is a style of metal that originated from a mix of doom metal with influences from gothic rock or dark wave. The riffing is generally slow to mid-tempo with catchy rhythms and dreary clean guitar interludes. The vocal style is predominantly clean or alternates clean with harsh. Bands with lead frontmen will often go for a gravelly or husky baritone range, while lead front women will usually go for ethereal soprano lines. Keyboards in the way of church organs, choral synth pads, or piano melodies are often utilized to create a ghostly or somber atmosphere. The overall mood of the music may be sensual, gloomy, or macabre, with lyrics about romance, death, grief, or sorrow. The aesthetic is often inspired by gothic literature, with band members clad entirely in black and images of castles, churches, graveyards, rosaries, candles, etc. Ultimately, I'm of the opinion that the typo-negative influence bands and the Beauty and the Beast acts both rightfully fall under the same umbrella, just on different ends of the spectrum. While the former shows much of its ties to traditional goth rock artists, the latter bears more resemblance to ethereal and neoclassical darkwave artists. Yet within the riffing, mood, atmosphere, and overall execution, there's enough overlap that they can comfortably fit within the same micro niche of metal. With that said, the following are my top 10 albums that I feel define the sound of gothic metal. Number 10, Catatonia's Discouraged Ones. Number 9, Tristania's Beyond the Veil. Number 8, Theater of Tragedy's Aegis. Number 7, Moonspell's Irreligious. Number 6, 
The Gathering's Mandy Lion. Number five, Tiamat's Wild Honey. Number four, My Dying Brides of the Angel in the Dark River. Number three, Paradise Lost Draconian Times. And then the top two are Bloody Kisses and October Rust by Typo Negative. So there you have it. That is my deep dive on the genre of gothic metal. Before I get my ass completely chewed out for not mentioning a specific band, I have curated an extensive gothic metal playlist on Spotify with a wide variety of songs, including bands I didn't mention in this video. I'll have that link down below. If you liked this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. You can also support me by following me on Instagram, TikTok, and Reddit. I also have finally dusted off my Discord account, so if you have any requests for future videos, I can be reached there as well. Last but not least, thank you to everyone who participated in my Gothic Metal Research Survey. I loved reading your responses and really appreciated the input. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and may your night be filled with blood and fire.